Can you pray with me today? Let's just kind of pause and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that as we open up your word in just a few moments, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do what I can't do, what none of us can do. I pray that you would take the truth of your word and drive it home to our hearts. Father, I I pray that you would help us to understand that you're a God of grace. You're a God of mercy. You're a God who is slow to anger. You're a God who abounds in steadfast love. You're a God who's sovereign. Help us to realize that you use the good and the bad. You use the triumphs and the tragedies. You use the things that we don't even understand to accomplish your will in our life. So I pray today that we would understand just a little bit more about you. Draw us closer to you. Help us to understand you. And Lord, help us to trust you. So thank you for what you're going to teach us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you a a personal question. Have you ever been angry with God? Let that kind of sink in for just a second. Have you ever been angry with God? Our gut reaction is to to say, no, 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 I, I, I couldn't get angry with God. But I would venture to say that, that all of us here at one time or another have either been angry at God or we weren't on the same page with God. You say, Brian, what, what are you talking about? Well, very simply, I mean that something happened in your life that didn't make sense to you. And you questioned how God could allow that to happen. For example, maybe you lost your job. You you thought you were a great employee. Everything was going well. Your reviews were good. And out of the blue, your boss comes in one day and you lose your job and, and your life, your family, your finances are put in a tailspin. And you sit back and think, God, how could you have allowed that to happen? Maybe you watched a loved one suffer and eventually die because of cancer. And you sat back and you struggled with God because of that. Maybe you know a family that lost a child. And you sit back and think that little one was so innocent. How could a loving God have taken that child's life? Maybe your kids walked away from God. You tried your best to bring them up uh, in in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as the Bible says, and, and, and they just walked away from God. And And you're ticked off about it. Maybe you were burned by a church. Maybe you were in church and the pastor treated you in an unkind way or a church member treated you in an unkind way. And you walked away saying, boy, if that's the way God is, if that's the way church is, then I want nothing to do with that. Maybe it wasn't something that happened to you. But you look and see the tragedies that are happening all around us, some of them here in our own community, and you ask, God, where are you? How could God, how could you have allowed that to happen? Why aren't you doing something about that? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever thought that way? Those are valid questions this morning. And I want I want to clarify that asking such difficult questions doesn't make you anti-God. Asking such difficult questions doesn't make you unspiritual. It doesn't even make you immature. Quite frankly, some of God's most successful prophets and preachers struggled with the same issues. As we conclude, the book of Jonah. Some of you are here for the first time. For the last four weeks, we've been walking through the book of Jonah, and today we're in Jonah chapter 4. But as we conclude the book of Jonah, we see Jonah, God's prophet, God's preacher, mad and angry with God. 
As a matter of fact, as we'll read and we'll look at the verses in just a few moments, God and Jonah are not on the same page. They're, they're miles apart. And it's interesting that as God delicately deals with his servant, he doesn't judge him, he doesn't condemn him, he doesn't punish him, but God in a loving way ministers to him. And through this passage, I believe that you and I can learn how should we respond whenever something happens in our life that doesn't make sense to us. And we, whether we verbalize it or not, whether we use the term angry or mad or ticked off or bitter, whatever it is, we find ourselves on a different page from God. So, so would you follow along? We're going to put the verses up on the screen. You might have your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad. I want to read. There's just 11 verses in the book of Jonah. I want to take my time and read through it and tell the story and then make some personal applications that I think will apply to each and every one of us. Before we read it, though, let me just give a review. I apologize because some of you maybe have never read through the book of Jonah. So, so as you begin the book, Jonah was commanded by God to take a message to the Ninevites. The message was real simple. We'll see it in just a moment. But instead of obeying God, Jonah did the exact opposite. God told him to go to Nineveh. He gets on a boat and heads to Tarshish. And so instead of going east to Nineveh, he heads west to Tarshish. Instead of going right, he goes left. He does the exact opposite of what God wants him to do. If you've read the story, you notice that as he's in the boat and he's heading across the Mediterranean, God sends a storm to get Jonah's attention. Jonah realizes that the storm was sent from God, and so he tells the sailors, throw me overboard. If you throw me overboard, the storm will stop. Well, obviously those sailors didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. They tried their best to bring the boat to shore. They couldn't do it, and so as a latch this, that, ditch effort, they cry out to God, ask for forgiveness, take Jonah, and toss him outside the ship. The storm immediately stops. Jonah lands in the water, and God has prepared a large fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah spends three days in the fish's belly. The text seems to indicate that Jonah died in the fish's belly and then was resurrected, but whether you believe that he died and was resurrected or whether he lived for three days in the fish's belly, regardless of whatever happened, the fish spits Jonah out on dry land alive. Jonah then once again hears from God. God says, Jonah, remember that command I gave you to go to Nineveh? I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to take the message that I tell you. So this time Jonah is obedient. We studied that last week in Jonah chapter 3. He travels the 500 miles to Nineveh. He arrives at Nineveh. He stands and preaches the message that God had given him. Just eight words, 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. Eight words in English, five words in Hebrew. Jonah fully expects the Ninevites to reject him, maybe run him out of town, and God to condemn and destroy the Ninevites. But something miraculous happens. There's a revival that takes place in the city of Nineveh, and the entire town, hundreds of thousands of people repent, put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repent and fast and cry out to God from the king all the way down to the least person in the city. What a great story. As we read that, how would you expect Jonah to respond? I know I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, man, I live for moments like that. I mean, if I could ever experience something that Joan experienced, I would be shouting, dancing, I'd be doing something, some expression of joy, some expression of jubilation. But Jonah responds differently. Follow along as we read chapter 4. Verse 1 says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Let me just pause because the Hebrew means that, that Jonah saw what God did, how he didn't destroy the Ninevites, how we saved them. And, and the Hebrew literally means this, what God did was evil to Jonah. Jonah looked how God saved the Ninevites and rather rejoicing, Jonah has a problem with God. And Jonah thinks that what God did was not right, it was not holy, it was not just. What God did in Jonah's eyes was evil. 
And as a result, Jonah was exceedingly displeased and angry. Verse 2, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? By the way, this is the first time that Jonah tells us his motives for running to Tarshish. Is not not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. God, that's why I left. I knew you were going to do this. The verse, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. This tells you how desperate Jonah was. This wasn't just some emotional tantrum that Jonah was displaying. He was so distraught. He was so upset. He says, God, I would rather be dead right now than alive. I notice it's interesting that God doesn't yell at him. God doesn't scream at him. God simply asks him a question. And the Lord said, verse 4, do you do well to be angry. God didn't scold him, didn't judge him. He simply asked him, is it right for you to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. So he made this little booth. He's going to look down over the city, waiting to see whether God destroys the city or not. He sat under it in the shade till till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and, it, and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Some believe that it was the castor oil plant. It's a plant with, which, with huge leaves that grows very quickly and dies very quickly. So God allows this plant to come and provide shade for Jonah so that he's not out in the sun. I love this phrase. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plants. Do you see the irony in the passage? He was exceedingly mad because God spared the life of hundreds of thousands of people. But he was exceedingly glad whenever God sent him a plant that gave him shade. Verse 7, but when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. I mean, I mean, I mean, here's Jonah. He's so frustrated. He's so upset with God. And, and so he, he builds this booth to overlooking the city, wanting God to destroy them. The sun's beating down on him. God miraculously allows this plant to grow up and provide shade. And, and Jonah's got to be thinking, well, hey, you at least demonstrate grace to me too. You demonstrated grace to the Ninevites. You ought to demonstrate some grace to me and give me some shade. And then the next day, God points a worm that kills the plant, (laughs) and the plant dies. Verse 8, when the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked once again that he might die, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. By, By the way, you ever been in a situation like that? where you're so upset, you're so distraught, you're so discouraged, you're so confused. You sit back and say, man, I I, I don't know whether I want to keep going. This was a spirit, this was God's prophet who said that. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, once again he asked them, do you do well to be angry for the plants? I'm not sure whether, we don't know God's motive, but it seems like God's being a little facetious right there, does he not? So, So let me ask you, Jonah, so... Is it okay for you to be mad about the plants? And notice notice Jonah still doesn't move in his position. He said, yes, I do well to be angry. Yes, my anger is justified. He says, angry enough to die. So so, so here's God and Jonah having this verbal back and forth, not now, not about the Ninevites, but now about a plant that has grown and died And now Jonah is just absolutely ticked off, and he's ready to end it all. Verse 10, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night, grew up one day and died the next day. God makes a simple statement. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons, 
who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Simply ask them a question, Jonah, if you pity a plant that was just here for a day, that you didn't cultivate it, you didn't plant the seed, you didn't do anything, it was here one day, gone the next, and you pity that plant, don't I have a right as the sovereign creator of the universe to pity those whom I have created and desire for them to be rescued. And he talks about hundreds of thousands of people because the phrase 120,000 who don't know their right hand from their left probably signifies that there were 120,000 little children there in the city, signifying that there were hundreds of thousands of adults as well. And then the Lord just adds one more point. And if you don't care about the people, what about the cattle? <laughs> Let's not lose the cattle. It's interesting, the book of Jonah ends with a question. There are only two books in the Bible that end with a question. The book of Jonah ends with a question, and the book of Nahum ends with a question. Interestingly, both Jonah and Nahum are prophets to none other than the same city, the city of Nineveh. It's interesting, this is the last we hear from Jonah. It's not like we can turn the page and say, well, Jonah finally changed his mind, and Jonah got right with God, and, and Jonah went on to be a great prophet. We, we know nothing else about Jonah's life. We don't know whether Jonah repented. We don't know whether Jonah was bitter for the rest of his life. We don't even know whether Jonah took his own life. The, the, the Bible doesn't give us any other information. We don't know whether he repented, whether he died a bitter old man, or whether God ever used him again. For years, I, I would read that and I would think, what a weird way to end a book of the Bible. <laughs> I, I mean, there's no closure to it. There, there's no clo I, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, when I read a book, it's like, do you ever, maybe you buy a book at the thrift store and you start reading, you get all the way to the last page and somebody's ripped out the last page. <laughs> And you're like, oh my word, I just, spent, I just spent six days reading this book and now I don't know how the book ends. That's kind of the way Jonah ends. You get to chapter 4 and verse 11 and, and you sit back and think, okay, <laughs> what now? What happened to Jonah? What happened to the Ninevites? Now we know what happened to the Ninevites because a hundred years later the Ninevites once again were incredibly wicked. God sends Nahum basically the same message that Jonah gave. Then this time the Ninevites didn't repent and God destroyed them. We know what happened to the Ninevites, but we don't know what happened to Jonah. Why is that? Why do you think that God allowed this book to end this way? For the longest time I thought, boy, it's weird. It's not the way it should end. And then I realized that God has a purpose in the book ending that way. And here's why. Because I can relate to Jonah. Can you relate to Jonah? There's times in my life that I have no clue what God is doing. And I struggle with God. You say, Brian, you're a pastor. You're supposed to have it all together. Man, if I'm supposed to have it all together, I don't. I hope the elders don't fire me tomorrow by saying that. <laughs> I don't. There, there's things in my life that I still don't get. There's things in my life that I still struggle with. And I think God allows this in the passage because he realized that as humans, it's difficult for us to understand him. And God, under, God comprehends the fact that you and I are on a journey. So having said all of that, there's just a couple of truths. If you have an outline there, I kind of walk through just a couple of truths that I want to share with you. Part of this is, is Brian's story. Part of this is your story. But I believe it relates to all of us today. The first is this. There are times when we are angered by God's actions. There's times when we, not, not, not just unbelievers, but believers, not, not just pagans, but, but Christians. There's times when, when we are angered by God's actions. All of us have times when God and us are all, not on the same page. We get upset and maybe even cry out, God, what are you doing? Have you ever been there? 
I've been there. 24 years ago, God gave us a little girl, Amber. If you're a, a part of HCC, you know Amber. If you're not, you don't know our story. God gave us a little girl named Amber. Amber was born with cerebral palsy. She's physically and mentally disabled. She's 24 today. She has the mental capacity of a three-month-old child. She's never understood anything we've ever said. She doesn't see. She doesn't communicate. She can't walk. She can't talk. She can't do anything. I'd be lying to you today if I told you there aren't times that I struggle with God. Amber was born while we were missionaries in Mexico, and, and I'd sit back and think, okay, God, I mean, we left our home, we left our country, we left our church, we did all of that to serve you. And please forgive me if it sounds unspiritual, but there's been times that I've said, and this is the way that you treat us? God, it, it doesn't make any sense. Life has not become easier. Today, today, Amber's legs are covered with hives. She said them for four weeks, we can't figure it out. And I cry out to God, even this morning, saying, God, how much does this little girl have to suffer? Where are you, God? What are you doing in our lives? But when I get that way, there's things that I have to remind myself. And there's things that I remind you today that we see in this passage that helps me and I trust will help you. The first thing that I wrote underneath that point is this, anger with God is, is caused by a misunderstanding of his heart. We get mad with God because we don't understand his heart and, and we judge him for being heartless. We judge him at times for being compassionate because we think that a loving uh, compassionate God wouldn't act this way. After all, we sit back and think, how could a loving God permit, permit the murder of innocent children? Have you ever thought that? I'm sure you have. How could a loving God authorize someone to suffer the ravages of cancer? If, if, if God was a God of love, why would he allow someone to go through that? How could a loving God tolerate the starvation of families in malnourished countries? Come on, God, do something about it. You're a loving God, do something about it. How could a loving God allow a family to experience one tragic death after another? As I mentioned, how could a loving God allow me to lose my job? In all of those cases, we question the compassion and love of God. We believe erroneously we believe that a loving God would not have allowed those things to happen and so in our minds we question we misunderstand the love of God and let me pause I don't want to go any further to make you think that I question the love of God God is love and even when we don't understand him God loves us and we'll see that at the end of the message. The second reason we get angry with God, we, ang we get angry with God because our, our anger with God is caused by a misinterpretation of his plan. That's what takes place here with Jonah. Jo jo Jonah was confident that God's plan was to destroy the Ninevites. I mean, he stood and proclaimed it for 40 days. In 40 days, God's going to destroy the city. As we talked about last week, there was no mention of repentance. Jonah never said, okay, if you repent, God is going to forgive you. His message was straightforward. Eight words. 40 days and Nineveh will repent. And as Jonah gave that message, day one, day two, day three, day four, day 39, day 40, he was confident he knew what God's plan was. He was confident that in the 40 days, he would go up to the hill and he would see God rain fire and brimstone upon the city of Nineveh. He thought he knew what God's plan was. But guess what? God did something different. God didn't change plans. Because we saw last week God acted according to his character. But, but, but in Jonah's mind, he's like, man, what happened there, God? <laughs> I thought we were on the same page. For 40 days, I've declared that you're going to destroy the city. And then what? You on a whim decide not to destroy the city? Jonah got angry because he misinterpreted God's 
plan. Oh, well, man, church, do we the same thing? Man, we're confident. We're absolutely confident. We go home and, honey, you're not going to believe it. I have this fantastic job interview. This is the job that I've always dreamed of. And I know God wants me to have this job. We've prayed about this. Man, this is it. I'm the guy. I'm going for the interview. I know. Man, this is God's plan. And I go in for the interview, and guess what? Somebody else gets the job. And we're like, <laughs> what happened, God? Were you sleeping? Did you take a nap? I mean, you were supposed to be for me. I remember years ago when we started our church in Mexico City, we'd outgrown the facility that we were in and we wanted to rent a building. And, and Vicki and I had found this building and we were confident this is the place that God wanted us to be. And so uh, we negotiated a price and then we went to our home church and we said, man, we have this fantastic opportunity. This building's right around the corner from where we're meeting and for only, what well, whatever, I don't remember how much it was for only this amount of money. Man, we can buy this church and this is the future of it. Would you guys help us? And we were so, we were so confident that's what God had for us. And the leaders of our home church took the information, prayed about it, and came back a few days later and said, no, nah, we don't think that's a wise decision. And I'm like, are you guys in Mexico City? We're the ones in Mexico City. What God are you talking to? We were confident that was God's plan, but it wasn't God's plan. Fast forward several years, God gave us a property that was a whole lot better in a whole lot better zone of the city, and we were able to build a church that today has a church building that seats 400 people. But, but at that moment, Brian and God weren't on the same page. Because I was confident this was God's plan for my life, but God had a different plan. You ever been there? Got angry with God. The third thing I said is this, anger with God is caused by a disparity between his priorities and your priorities. Think about that with Jonah and God. Jonah wanted the Ninevites what? Dead, right? I mean, I mean that was a priority to Jonah. Man, he wanted those Ninevites destroyed. All right, God. We're on the same page here. We punish sinners. That's what we do. We go into wicked cities. We preach destruction. I preach destruction. You destroy them. We're a team. That's what we do. Jonah's priority was to see the Ninevites destroyed. God's priority was to see the Ninevites saved. They had two different you ever found yourself in a place in which your priorities were different from God's? And it's not like you're sitting back saying, okay, I want to do something extremely wicked and God wants me to do something righteous. That'd be a no-brainer. We get that. But sometimes we are confident that this is what God wants. This is going to demonstrate the holiness, the righteousness of God. This is what God wants. And God comes along and shows us that his priorities are different than ours and we get angry by the way let me just pause for a second because we as we travel through scripture we can always see what God's priorities are you say Brian what are God's priorities he always desires to glorify himself always his, his priority for your life is in my life is for us to become more like Jesus that's priority number one for your life Priority number one is not for you to get rich, have a beautiful house, drive a Lexus, and send your kids to the best schools in the county. God's priority for your life is for you to become like Jesus. And he will do whatever it takes to get you and to get me there. His priority is for the gospel to be proclaimed and lived out. So, so here's the first thing that I want us to see and I want us to admit today. There's times that we get angry with God. Would you agree with that today? And yet our anger is not caused by our justice and God's injustice. It's not caused by our fairness and God's unfairness. Our anger is caused by the fact that we misunderstand his love. Our anger is caused by the fact that we misinterpret his plan. Our anger is caused by the fact that his priorities are different than ours, and as a result, we're not on the same Here's the second thing that I want us to notice in the passage. It's this. 
God always, always acts according to his character. God always acts according to his character. Let me remind you today that God is not capricious. God, God doesn't act on a whim. God isn't driven by his emotions. Every single thing God does, everything he does is a demonstration of his character. Everything he does in your life, everything he does in my life, everything he does in the city of Hollywood, everything he does in Broward County, everything he does in South Florida, everything he does in Florida, everything he does in our country, everything that God does in the world is a demonstration of his character. He never violates his character. We might accuse him of being unloving, but he's never unloving. We might accuse him of being unfair, but he's never unfair. We might accuse him of being unjust, but he is never unjust. Why is that? Because in his character, God is love. God is holy. God is just. God is right. And he will never violate his character. Jonah even declares that here in this chapter. Jonah says, God, I knew you weren't going to destroy the Ninevites. I knew it. And why does he say that? He says, because, and then he goes through and he gives us a beautiful description of God's character. And I want us to see two things about God's character in this chapter. The first thing we see is this, that God is gracious. God is gracious, and I mentioned those four phrases, so let me, let me just kind of flesh out those four phrases for a second. In verse 2, he says, for I knew that you are a gracious God. It's interesting, this term gracious is used in, throughout the Bible, but it is only used in reference to God. This word is never used to say that Abraham was gracious or Moses was gracious or John the Baptist was gracious. It is only used in description of who God is. It literally means a heart of compassion. Here's what the term means. A distributor of grace. And, and, and so Jonah looks at God. He said, I knew that you wouldn't destroy the Ninevites because you're a distributor of grace. You, you have a heart of compassion. He uses the second term. He says, you're merciful. The word, it, it's a synonym to the word gracious. It means compassionate, but it means to not give what one deserves. We've used the illustration before that grace is receiving what I don't deserve while mercy is not receiving what I do deserve. So God in not destroying the Ninevites was merciful in not giving them what, he deserved, what they deserved, but he also was gracious in giving them what they didn't deserve. They did deserve condemnation. He didn't give it to them. They didn't deserve to be rescued in his grace. He did that. So Jonah says, you're a, a gracious, merciful God. I love the third one. He says, you're slow to anger. Isn't that the opposite of us? How many of you have a short fuse? All right, that's six of you. So let, let me ask you a question again. How many of you have a... How many of you have a spouse who has a short fuse? <laughs> ah, more hands go up right there, huh? You, you might say you don't have a short fuse, put you on 441 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to drive five miles, and it takes you 40 minutes. All of us have a short fuse, right? All right, we're all quick to anger. We get anger quickly. Aren't you glad today that God is not like that? Aren't you glad that God just doesn't blow up quickly? And, and we see it with Jonah. I mean, he could have blown up with Jonah. He didn't. He was slow to anger. He was patient with him. He was long-suffering. He was slow to lose his patience. I am so glad that God is slow to lose his patience with me because I try God's patience, I'm sure, on a regular basis. If that's humanly possible, I'm sure he's divine. His patience can't be tried. If it could, I would try his patience. He's slow to anger. I love the next phrase, abounding in steadfast love. It's the Hebrew word, hesed. It's a word that describes God's covenant, loyal love for his people. 
And so Jonah looks at God and says, man, I knew you weren't going to destroy those Ninevites. Because you're going to give them what they don't deserve. You're not going to give them what they do deserve. You're not going to get mad at them when they deserve to be gotten mad at. And you're going to demonstrate them that covenant love that you always demonstrate. You're gracious. That's what Jonah says. The truth is that God is always gracious. God is always gracious. Would you repeat that back with me today? God is always gracious. Please again. God is always gracious. Even when we think that his actions lack compassion, he is extremely loving. Even when we think that he doesn't act the way that he should act, he always does because John 4, 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. That's his character. He will not and he cannot violate his own character. Well, well, Brian, what about all the tragedy in the world then? Because God is not only gracious, Jonah, and this is what Jonah 4 declares, but God is also sovereign. God is gracious, but he is also sovereign. As a sovereign God, he has righteous and holy control over all of his creation. His sovereignty is actually illustrated three times in this passage. He uses a word three different times in the passage that demonstrate his sovereignty. In verse 6, he says, God appointed a plant. In verse 7, it says, God appointed a worm. In verse 8, it says, God appointed a scorching east wind. So you might sit back and say, okay, Man, Brian, why all the drama? Why does God go through all of that with the growing the plant and then killing the plant and then the scorching each wind? I mean, I mean, why does God go through all of that drama? And the simple truth is, is, is that there is a message that God wanted Jonah to see. And here's the message. This is this is this is tough. This is this is mature stuff, okay? Put your thinking caps on. Here's the message. The message is this, as the sovereign Lord, God has the freedom to dispense his grace in a way and in a measure that he sees fit. Let me say it again. As the sovereign Lord, God has the divine right to dispense his grace in a time, in a way, that he sees fit. That's what's taking place in Jonah 4. He can show grace to the Ninevites by forgiving them, and then he cannot show grace to Jonah by killing the plants. In both cases, God is completely fair and completely just in his actions. He's a sovereign Lord. He can demonstrate mercy on whoever he decides to demonstrate mercy. He can demonstrate justice on whomever he decides to demonstrate justice. Why is that? Because he is sovereign. He is God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is in control all the time. Two times in scripture we find this. It's found in Exodus chapter 33, and we find it in Romans chapter 9 and verse 15, where God makes this statement. He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God in his sovereignty at times decides to to demonstrate mercy and at other times decides to withhold his mercy. And And by the way, that doesn't make him unjust because every single person is condemned before God. All of us are. There's not a single person that can say, hold on a second. I'm the pastor of Hollywood Community Church. I deserve special treatment. And God's like, no, man, Brian, (laughs) you're a sinner that struggles with sin. Were it not for the gospel, were it not for Jesus Christ, you'd be headed down the wrong road. None of us deserve what we have. It's all a demonstration of God's mercy. Let me tell you a parable real quick, and I'm going to end shortly. 
In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells a parable of the workers in the vineyard. I'm going I'm to synthesize the parable. And so in the parable, this, this, this man owns a vineyard, and he decides to employ some laborers in the morning. And he says, okay, I'm going to employ you for a certain amount of money, let's say $50. I'm going to employ you, employ you for $50. And the workers say, okay, that's great, man. We're going to work 12 hours for $50. And three hours later, he says, hey, you know what? I need more and more employees. So he gathers another group of men. And he says, okay, these guys started at 6, you're starting at 9. I want you to work the rest of the day. And by the way, guess what I'm going to pay you? I'm going to pay you $50. And then at noon, he says, you know what, I need another group of workers. And so he grabs another group of workers and he said, okay, I need you to work from 12 to 5. And here's what I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you $50. And then at 3 o'clock, the laborer says, I still need more workers, and so I'm going to grab some more workers, and you guys are going to work from 3 to 5, and here's what I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you $50. And the laborers who started 6 at 6 in the morning said, whoa, wait a second, we worked all day long, and you're paying us $50? And these sorry, no good losers are coming in at 3 o'clock, working for two hours, and you're going to pay them the exact same thing? Unfair. You're an unfair owner. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 15, it says this, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? In other words, he looked at the guys that started at six and says, I'm, not, I'm completely fair. How much did I promise you? How much was it I promised you? $50. Is that what I'm giving you? Yeah, good. So why are you mad at me if I decide to be generous to these people over here who work less than you, but in my compassion and my love and my care for them, I decide to be maybe more generous to them? You see, church, we got to understand that God is sovereign. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's kind, he's loving, but he's a sovereign God. And who were we, his minute, tiny creation, to question the sovereignty of God? Let me show you three other things and I'm done. Steps to take when you're angry with God. You might be here today, as a matter of fact, I'm confident that there are people here in a crowd this size that are upset with God. Maybe you're not upset with God today, but something could happen in the future in which you get upset with God. What are some steps to take? Let me give you three simple steps, and I'm going to be done today. The first is this. Trust God's heart even when you can't understand his plan. Trust God's heart even when you can't understand his plan. It was Charles Hayden Spurgeon who made the now famous quote, God is too good to be unkind, and he's too wise to be mistaken. So when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. So whenever something happens in your life and something that happens in my life that we just don't understand, i got to pull back because it happens to us on a regular basis. i got to pull back and say, hold on. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I might not understand what God's doing in my life, but I know his heart, and I know he loves me. God loves you in your triumphs, and God loves you in your tragedies. God loves you when you're healthy. God loves you when you're sick. God loves you whenever you agree with his plan, and God loves you whenever you don't agree with his plan. Trust his heart. He's loving, compassionate, kind, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The second thing is this. Remember that human tragedy is the consequence of sin. We often want to blame God for the terrible things that happen in the world. Let us remember, though, that it was sin that opened the door for sickness, death, war, and human tragedy. It wasn't God's plan. It was, it, was, it was sin that entered into the world, and death by sin, sickness by sin, tragedy by sin, atrocities by sin. We live in a world of sinners. Why does it surprise us when sinners act like sinners? 
We need to realize that human tragedy is the consequence of sin. Let me mention the third. I want to show you a quick video and I'm done. Realize that God's plan to show compassion and bring healing may involve you. You see, God just might place you in the midst of suffering. God just may allow you to suffer. God may allow you to go through a difficulty, experience a difficulty, live through a difficulty, because he wants you to bring hope to the hopeless. He wants you to bring light in a dark situation. I want you to see the video of Alex. Alex is the band director at Stoneman Douglas High School. Alex lived through the tragedy that they experienced just a few weeks ago. Can you watch Alex's testimony? Do we have that, Evan? I was actually in the band room with my top band, which is the Wind Symphony. It was the fourth uh, class, the fourth block, about 20 minutes before school ended and the fire alarm went off. We started realizing that there was an active shooter on campus. We didn't know initially, uh, but one of the assistant principals was actually in there with us and uh, she had her walkie talkies and so I could hear what was taking place. It reminded me that we are not in control, that we are human and that we have to rely completely on God. One of the questions that has been asked of me early on was, why would a loving God allow this to happen? Which is probably a difficult question to answer. But in my mind, and being a believer and knowing God, we are the ones that allow sin into the world. This is a broken world because of us. I brought sin. And so we made that choice initially through Adam and Eve. And God allows us to make choices, good and bad. The constant is God is there through triumphs and tragedies, through good and bad. It rains on the just and the unjust. And he is looking for us to turn to him, whether things are going well or not. So that... That was my reaction as a Christian. As a teacher, you know, the, the day after this happened, there was the prayer vigil that took place here at Parkridge, and Pastor Eddie was one of the first people that I came in contact with, and he looked at me and he said, Alex, you're here for such a time as this. And that hit me really hard, because obviously, what is our purpose here on earth? Well, it's to bring glory to God through everything that we do. This was just magnified a thousand times because you know that people were gonna be looking for answers. And so as a teacher, I feel that my reaction and response and the things that I say, the things that I do, were going to be pivotal in the lives of not only the students, but the parents, the faculty, my colleague, everybody that looks at how Alex Kaminsky is responding, that's going to be some sort of witness that will either bring glory to God or not. And so I really have felt that responsibility to a much higher degree than I ever have before. Since then, I have seen God working. Um, for example, that evening of the prayer vigil, there was a sunset vigil here at uh, the city of Parkland. So I called the band together, uh, the entire program together about a half hour before. And I didn't, didn't know what I was going to say to them. And I got up in front of them, and the first thing I said was, I love you. And then I said a few more words, and, and then they sort of hugged, and I told them we were going to you know, get through this together. Um, and afterward, I had uh, students and parents saying, what you said was just what we needed to hear. And to be honest, I couldn't even tell you what I said to them. God can cause things to work for good, to those that love him and are called according to his purpose, and I am very focused on bringing glory to him in every way possible because uh, this is a broken world and we need God in our lives. He's the constant. We will make choices, good and bad, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's our anchor. Amen. Alex goes to a Park Ridge Church, one of our sister churches here in the community. So, so here's the truth. 
God desires to bring triumph out of tragedy. God desires to use even the worst situations of our life that we don't comprehend, that we don't get. And by the way, he never promised us an explanation for things. But he's promised that all things work together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. God just may be allowing you to go through what you're going through, what you've been through, what you'll go through, so that you can be light in the midst of darkness. So that you can be hope in the midst of hopelessness. So whenever we go through something that we don't understand, the question should not be, why God? I mean, we can ask that and probably not going to get the answer until we get to heaven. But a, a better question might be, what is it, God, that you're teaching me? What is it, God, that you want me to do? How can I represent you in the midst of this tragedy? What happened to Jonah? We'll have to wait till we get to heaven and ask him personally. Who knows, maybe Jonah's going to have a seminar in heaven, you know, how not to respond to a revival or something like that. <laughs> Let's learn from Jonah. God's at work in your life. He wants to be glorified in your life. More than anything else, he wants to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. That's what he's going to accomplish. Sometimes we're pretty hard-headed. And we don't get it the first time or the second time or the third time. But allow God to work in your life. Would you stand with me? Vicki's going to lead us in a great song of worship today. I, I would say if you're here today and there's never been a time when you've personally confessed your sins and reached out to Jesus Christ as the only Savior of your life, that's what God, that's the starting point. We have elders and deacons down front who would love to take the word of God and and explain the gospel to you. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're mad. You're bitter. Would you just come and lay that on an altar? Say, okay, God, I might not understand what you're doing, but I love you. I trust your heart. Maybe you have a family member who's struggling with that and you just want to come and spend time in prayer, whatever it is. Would you allow the Holy Spirit of God to use the word of God? and speak directly to you. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you that you don't just paint beautiful pictures in scripture, that everybody in scripture is perfect. Thank you that you've allowed for scripture to betray people just like us. Help us to realize today how much we need Jesus. Help me to realize how much I need you in my life. Help us to surrender ourselves to you and to trust you no matter what happens. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.